we should be live. We're ready for spaghetti. I think so. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone to uh, this edition of PS Power Hour. Uh, we're without Mr. James Petty this week, but uh, he'll be rejoining us, I'm sure. And um, so you've got Mixmaster Corey stepping in to run the stream, myself, Thomas Rayner, and Adil Lagari of Chocolatey fame uh, here with us uh, doing an AMA on his new book, uh, Shell of an Idea. You know him from his other wildly successful and popular publications like PowerShell and the Month Launches, uh, DevOps Collective Ventures like the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit, and a variety of uh, other super popular endeavors there. Uh, Don Jones. Uh, this is where applause should be running, but uh, it's a live stream and a virtual event. So you I really also want to quickly mention uh, Don's fiction works, which are actually very, very engrossing too. So I have the full collection. I got to say, oh. I'm working my way through it slowly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I desperately need to get the third of the Achilles books done. I'm about halfway through it. Um, so it is up on LeanPub and about halfway through form. Um, but uh, I had a publisher reach out about a new nonfiction project that kind of intrigued me. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to it. Me and John Walls from uh, Power Scripting will for sure debrief about it as soon as it comes out. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you're here today um, kind of doing the uh, shell of an idea book tour almost for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and I read it, um, what day of March is this? It's, time has lost all meaning. I read <laughs> yeah. it uh, about March a month or two ago. Yeah, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I gave it a read, and I got to admit, I didn't know what to expect at first because I'd never really read any other origin stories for other programming languages, and I wasn't uh, sure that I got it. But uh, I got to say, like after reading it, totally get it. It's a uh, it's a pretty fascinating story. Um, <clears throat> your passion for PowerShell really comes through, and uh, and is quite evident and uh, relatable, uh, especially as someone who shares passion for PowerShell. Um, so obviously, uh, highly recommended uh, <laughs> reading, but um, I'm excited that we've got you here today to kind of answer some questions about and related to that to that book. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump in. What's what's first? Um, I've got one. Adele, is that okay if I go? Sure. Um, so this one is from John, and uh, I think it's pretty on topic. Um, the question is, PowerShell ended up being lightning in a bottle for Microsoft, uh, showing up to help transition to the cloud and scaling services. Uh, how do you think a company should, should encourage PowerShell-like projects and ideas? Or is Jeffrey just a magical unicorn? Like, is this kind of lightning in a bottle project repeatable? And if so, how? Um, I think it is repeatable. I, I don't know that companies should encourage it per se, right? Like Microsoft never encouraged PowerShell. In fact, if you, if you read the book, um, there was a, a segment within Microsoft that knew they had a problem and they knew that something like PowerShell could solve it. But what they really thought would solve it was just porting the Unix corn shell over to Windows, right? Nobody ever woke up at Microsoft who wasn't Snover and said, we need this thing. But what, what Jeffrey does or what Jeffrey did and anyone can do this, is he really understood the problem. He understood the, the thing that was hurting Microsoft as a business. And he understood how to kind of operate the political machine and the company that he worked with. And if, if you can be forceful enough, but not, not like pushy or arrogant, if you're like, look, this is a problem. We've all agreed this is a problem. Here's how I can solve it. And he had some data behind it. I, I think that's something that a lot of people don't get. It's like you, you can't just run into a CIO or a CTO with your gut instinct and say, hey, I think this is going to solve this problem. He had some data behind it. You know, remember, he, he had already done work with um, what well, he was first brought to the company to make command line tools. That was it. And they spent millions and millions of dollars making, you know, three or four dozen command line tools. And then... He decided to get into WMIC as a way of, of kind of expanding that reach because WMI could already do so much and there had already been so much investment in WMI 
And he realized that if he did it in a certain way, he could spend a million dollars and get hundreds of commands. And that's really where the idea for PowerShell's structure came from. You know, let's, let's do something that lets us create uh, an engine, a, a shell that does a lot of heavy lifting so that other people can write tons and tons and tons of commands with relatively little investment. So, you know, he didn't, he didn't so much invent PowerShell as he invented a way of making all of Microsoft's other developers more efficient and more, more valuable at solving a shared problem. And I, I think you really have to see that to understand how he was able to, to keep the budget and keep the team together and keep that thing rolling. Uh, you know, look at the, the pivot they made when, when Brian Valentine basically killed PowerShell. He said, you're not shipping this in the product. Withdraw your, your DCR. And they said, no, we're not withdrawing it. You have, to, you have to hammer it. Like we want it on the record that you did this. And the, the team immediately started shopping for another customer and they found the exchange team that had had the same ideas along the same lines. And it was just, it was a good time. So I, I think anybody can do that in any company. It's just a lot of us aren't good at talking about the business and we're not really good at driving to a, a, an outcome with data and saying, look, this is how this is going to go and I can prove it. You don't have to believe me. We're not talking about Santa Claus. I've got data and science here. Uh, I think that's just something that Jeffrey is incredibly good at. Um, he's also very humble. I, I think that helps when you're trying to be, when you're trying to be forceful about something, but you're very humble about it. It doesn't get people's back up as much. And so he was able to, to, you know, get those things done. And honestly, you know, if you've met anybody on the team, um, um, Bruce Payette, who's just a, a genius, but he's, he's just very down to earth, you know, tech geek guy. Um, Lee Holmes, who's, who's gotten so many things into the product, into Windows that people don't even know about. But he's just a very you know, humble, down-to-earth type of guy that you can sit and, and have a beer with. Um, I think that helps a lot, is that there was not a lot of arrogance running around. There was just a lot of, of humble, look, this is the right thing to do, and we can prove it. Both those folks are Canadian, by the way. Just a plug. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, so is um, you know, Aaron Chappelle, who was the, the partner program manager of the group for a long time. Um, Canada, Canada contributed quite a bit to, to PowerShell. And so are Corey, Adil, and I. So you're surrounded. There we go. Yeah, I think it's um, <clears throat> kind of one of those unique things that's uh, everybody on that team is like a world-class talent. Even today, it seems like it's, uh, uh, it's pretty impressive. They have some of the most yeah, technical but, project managers yeah. and program managers that I've seen on a team. Yeah, and that, that's... That's the benefit of working for a giant company like Microsoft that can chuck that kind of resources at a problem. Uh, and that's what they're, they're known for doing. And they've gotten better and better and better at that. You know, even, even if we, you know, take a moment to beat up on Microsoft from the days of, of Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, when, when they were definitely a different type of company than they are now, they still had brilliant people. Like if, if you look at what they did to make Windows NT a thing, and just destroyed NetWare. I mean, took NetWare apart from the foundation up and, and had Windows machines running in nearly every department of every company on planet Earth within just a few years. They're, it's a talented company. Um, I think sometimes they haven't always used their powers for good, but um, they, you know, under, under Nadella, they're certainly doing a much better job of that. I, I think they're, they've earned a lot more respect from people because of that, but they've always had that type of you know, really powerful resource. It's like with any other company, right? Where things go long, wrong is with your leadership. It's where the leaders point those resources that determines the outcome. Thanks, Don. Um, uh, is it okay if I can take one there, Thomas? Please do. Okay, awesome. I got a couple here from Russell Rofer um, that were really good, um, sort of... Uh, sort of interesting, fun ones for you, Don. So um, the first one, the first part, so it's a three-parter. The first part is, um, at what point did you realize that PowerShell was taking off in popularity enough to write a book about its inception and growth? So kind of what's what led to the genesis of this book? I know it was an idea of yours for a while. Yeah, um, I knew that PowerShell was going to be successful in 2005. Like, you know, when the, the public Monad betas really started coming out, I knew that was going to be the successor to VBScript. I knew it was going to far surpass VB script. Um, I told Snover it would take a decade. And he's like, no, it'll take half that time. 
and it took a little longer than a decade to really, really hit the, the zeitgeist where it needed to be. I wanted to write Shell of an Idea probably 10 years ago because by then, you know, so, so that would have been 2010. We'd had PowerShell for four years. We were, I think, at version three or four. And, and, and look, at that point, version three of PowerShell, PowerShell itself was locked down. Like nothing had changed. We'd had remoting for a year. We had the core language. We had all the commandlets. We were just getting more coverage at that point. You know, they were, they were adding features for sure. Workflow came along and that was, that was interesting and fun. But, but PowerShell itself was mature and people were adopting it. And I had heard all of these stories. You know, you go to, to Ignite or TechEd or whatever it was at the time and, you know, you're at the bar with, with Snover or, or Lee or June Blender or any of those, you know, Jim Truer, all those folks. And they're telling these stories, like these fun bar NDA stories that you know, like, we need to, we need to capture this guys. Like we need to write a book about this and I'd love to. And they're like, uh, not now. And if you, so it, <laughs> writing Shell of an idea really had nothing to do with when did PowerShell become popular. If you look at the cast of characters that's in the front of the book and there's, there's kind of a bullet list of all the people on the team. And I know there's a formatting issue and it has to do with lean pubs, uh, parser that, that made the book, but the next bullet list is executives. And these are all the people who helped and hindered PowerShell and none of them work for Microsoft anymore. And that's why now is the time to write the book because most of the repercussions are pretty much off the table. So as with most decisions, there was a political component there. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, people had to feel safe telling the story because it's mm -hmm. not, I mean, not everybody is a good guy in the story, right? Makes well, a lot and Don, of sense. what are they gonna revoke your MVP status? Oh, I did not get rewarded this year, but that wasn't because of the fuck. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I believe that was more for your decision to. Yeah, to yeah, I've, I've just really had to step away from the technology and I'm, I'm not contributing at the level that most MVPs do. And so um, I knew last cycle that that was my last, that was my 16th. Yeah, same thing happened with Rob over here at Chocolatey and he, he kind of like, he was at the nine year mark and he was like, oh, should I go for the decade or just focus on the, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, life changes. So and, and in a lot of ways, that was the other reason this was the right time to write the book is, is this is kind of my swan song in the PowerShell world. Um, I, I won't be writing more PowerShell books. Uh, and so this felt like a good capstone. I wrote the first published book on PowerShell and this will be my last one that kind of tells the whole story. There's an audible scream from the audience here. <laughs> many, many different <laughs> chat channels. Um, oh, we'll move on to part two before before we uh, get distracted. So it's, this is a good one, actually. I like this one. Whom did you want to interview for the book but couldn't get the interview scheduled? Sort of the ungettable get. Yeah, there was a few. And, you know, it, it was just nothing more than scheduling. Like, I, I needed to get the book done. Um, I, I really didn't get a chance to talk to June Blender and I, I really wished I had, but she's at, she's at AWS and she's just slammed. She's busy all the time. God bless her. Wonderful woman. Um, I, I really wish I had gotten time to talk to Thomas Lee, who was one of the first PowerShell MVPs. Um, I didn't, again, he just, you know, he's retired, but he, he had stuff going on and, and he's 87 million time zones away. And so it just, it got complicated and I, I needed to, like I'd set myself a deadline and I needed to get it. Um, I had actually planned to fly up to Seattle and sit with Lee and Bruce and Ken Hansen and Angel Calvos. And I was, I had a few hours scheduled with Jeffrey, um, Jim Truer, and then the world shut down. So I wound up doing everything for remote calls from my cabin in Utah. Um, and everybody was pretty good about making time. I, I, you know, those are two folks that definitely stand out. There's a bunch more and a lot of it's just, Folks have moved on. Um, with Fat, uh, Dan Harmon, like it's just, it's hard to, you know, connect with people now that they've moved on and they've been moved on for so long. Um, when, when Kenneth and Angel left the company, that's when I realized that I was, I was starting to lose my grasp on the people who had these stories. And that was kind of another driver for it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's a pretty long list. I, I, I probably could have spent a year just doing, doing interviews and the book would have been twice as long. But it's nothing like a, a global pandemic to throw a curveball into your scheduling. Eh? It, it sort of did. Understandable. Very cool. Thanks. And the last piece of the question is, um, do you think PowerShell will overtake the rest of the languages in popularity in, on GitHub? If not, how can I help to ensure that it does? <laughs> uh, no, it won't. Because it's not the right tool for every job. 
You know, I mean, you, you can't build a house with a hammer alone. You need a lot of different tools. Um, Python has earned its place in people's toolboxes for a variety of different jobs. PowerShell has earned its place and there's definitely overlap, but like if, if I'm a developer and I'm trying to create something that's highly performant, that's going to be highly cross-platform, I'm, I'm probably still writing in C++, right? Uh, you know, if, if I'm trying to do something that's, th th there's languages where, where, or situations where JavaScript is the right answer. You know, if you're doing a lot of web dev stuff, um, PowerShell's optimized for certain things. Like you gotta understand that, that there's decisions made when they created PowerShell and decided to write it in .NET and do it the way they did. And those decisions mean they decided not to do things. And what, one of the things they decided not to do was overly optimized for performance. You know, they wanted ease of use and consistency and reach and the ability to glue together lots of different things. And that serves PowerShell's purpose as an administrative tool. But, you know, it's, it's not Python. It's, it's, it doesn't have the expansive reach. You know, PowerShell is probably never going to be a, a, a data scientist's language of choice. You know, they're going to go for Python or R or something like that. Um, I, I think, you know, the real lesson is that if you're in the industry, you can't just be running around with a hammer. You need a wrench and some drivers and a drill and all the different tools it takes to put a house together. If you get overly religious about one thing, you're, you're really just hemming yourself in and you're going to wind up working harder. Um, the, the, the skill today is the polyglot. And it's hard for people to see that, I think, because 20 years ago, right, you were choosing between C Sharp and C++ and Java. Like you could pick one of those and you were probably fine. You, you could do whatever you needed to do. That's not where we are now. There's over 600 programming languages out there and half of them are JavaScript. And each of them is specialized for a particular thing. It's one of the reasons that microservices architecture has become so popular because each little bit of your architecture can be written in a different language that is appropriate for the exact thing it's doing. So we're getting more, more fifth generation languages that are extremely specialized and you need to know all the ones that are gonna be applicable to you. I, I will specifically add a plug for uh, your uh, keynote from Summit last year, Don, where you were actually highlighted the idea of having more tools in your tool belt, specifically the polyglot bit of it. And I think, especially uh, as you said, with the dawn of microservices and APIs talking to each other, we very much need to be cognizant of the fact that we will need to learn different modalities to be able to still be successful. So, yeah, yeah. I, I know PHP really well. Um, I've done a lot of web coding in PHP. I know um, Active Server Pages, the original one, as well as ASP.NET. And there are times when I, I pick up a project and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to do this in PHP because I, I know it. I really don't. I'm pushing 50. I, I have no reason to learn a new language. And I'll get halfway through, I'm like, oh, crap, you know, if I had just done this in Node, I'd be done by now and already having a drink. And, you know, I, I chose the wrong tool and I'm working harder because of it. So maybe it's worth me investing some time so that I can do this the right way. It would also be like a 10 gig project with Node automatically. <laughs> right, right. And that looks fantastic. Yeah, it kind of seems like in 2020 and indeed previously, the most valuable skill you can have is the ability to learn new skills. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it is one of the reasons that I, I took a job with Pluralsight. And it's one of the reasons that I've, I've been so happy with the company is because that's, that's what we do. We try to make it as easy as possible for people to pick up new skills because that is your, that is your skill. That is what future proofs you is the fact that you are a human being and we can learn things. We can learn to do things we never knew how to do before. Um, if, if, you know, right now we're obviously in a tough time where there's a lot of people furloughed, a lot of people out of work, and there are job openings. My company is hiring. Uh, there are companies all over the world who are hiring. It's a matter of do you have the skills? People are like, well, no, I don't. It's not like a four year college degree. You can pick up a new tech skill. Anyone can pick up a new tech skill anywhere in the world relatively quickly, and it unlocks this massive potential to, to lift yourself up to wherever you want to be in life. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, way off track from the original question, but that is your skill. That is what will future proof your life and protect your family. Right on. Uh, Adil, uh, did, were there any more on that thread? 
No, that was the three-parter. I'll let you go now, and then I'll pick up another one after. Uh, well, do we have, uh, I don't have the chat open. Are there any burning questions from our live, not in studio audience? If we don't have any, uh, any big ones there, then I have one. There is one I can throw in here um, that wasn't in, thrown into the chat, which is specifically during the writing, you had to do deep research into some events of the past. How did you separate the chaff from the wheat? And what was the biggest, oh, bleep moment for you? <laughs> um, you know, it's hard because I, I knew a lot of these stories. Like I've, I've been at this, um, Jeffrey and I have been friends and colleagues, you know, for a long time. I don't want to think about it. Um, so I, I knew a lot of these stories. A lot of it was about digging into the detail. For me, I, I didn't have a great chronology. Like I knew that all these things happened, but I, I wasn't clear on what order they happened. Um, the, the biggest, I think, revelation for me was talking to Daryl Ray, who was on the original uh, Kermit team that was going to do a, a corn shell port to services for Unix running on Windows. And that was gonna solve all of Intel's problems. And I, I didn't have most of that background in history and it puts so much of it together. And that's where I realized this is where Microsoft decided to spend money. And then Jeffrey quite honestly kind of hijacked that effort and convinced everyone that his way was a better idea to solve the actual problems the company was facing. Um, but he hijacked that effort, which had been funded and had headcount and had budget and all that other stuff. Uh, so I, I think that kind of set the chronology along. And, and, and once I had the chronology, I wanted to stick with it. Like, like any book is a story. I'm not writing an encyclopedia. I'm, I'm trying to tell a story about a thing that happened and the people who made it happen. And so once you kind of have the spine of your story, and for me, it was that chronology, then you can kind of decide what fits and what you're not going to talk about as much. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple of appendixes in the book. There's the hula monkey, which I think is the, the most hilarious source control mechanism I've ever heard of. Um, but it's in an appendix because it was kind of a tangent to the main thread of the story. Um, so you, you kind of, when you teach or when you're writing a book, I, I think you have to make a promise to your reader that they are here today and they will be in this different place tomorrow. And then you have to take them through the shortest, easiest, smoothest journey from point A to point B. And you have to set aside things that you might want them to know, knowing that you can loop around later. Like once you've done the journey, you can still tell some of these things, which is what the appendixes in the books do. Um, so I, I, I think the chronology really drove a lot of that. I, I, I would struggle to find anything that was really super substantive that got left out. Um, if anything, I, I probably erred more on the side of including some stuff sometimes not because the story itself was so important, but because of the way it was told to me was so good. Like, like Jeffrey, Jeffrey can turn a phrase. Like there, there's one phrase that I really wish I could have put in the book, but it was completely inappropriate. And Jeffrey didn't say it. He re relayed it to me. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to say that about that person. Um, but you know, Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's got that, that Boston kind of syntax. So it, it can get colorful pretty quickly. Um, but Ken Hansen is also just, you know, he, he's amazing at, at coming up with an analogy that just makes your eyes go, wow, that's impactful, dude. I, like, I totally get where you're going. So there's some of those things that were definitely included more because it, I think it helped convey the personalities that were involved, um, which is an important part of the story. Yeah, it, it's called Windows, Jeffrey. It is a, yeah. yeah, that was one that that Jeffrey's was delivery of that in... <laughs> And mm -hmm. I think it was some keynote. I don't remember which. What part of Windows don't you the way understand? He delivered yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, awesome. Um, so a little bit more of a um, strategic tactical question um, from John. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit and add some. Um, how do Windows PowerShell users migrate to PowerShell core? Uh, is that a bridge too far because of how it's so tied to Windows? Um, and I'd kind of add on to that. Um, just generally how to motivate um, stakeholders, uh, both technical and non-technical, that um, taking a .NET core dependency, moving to version 6 and 7, um, how do you get that done? Yeah, I... I don't know that there's a huge press to, to migrate. You know, it, it, 
you got to look at yourself as, as a bundle of useful skills. Uh, if you're a driver, if you know how to drive a car, then, you know, maybe, maybe you have a pickup truck and you're thinking about migrating to a sedan. Well, you, you would never just wake up in the morning and go, I wonder if we should just migrate to a sedan. There's a new sedan out and sedans are nice. And, and I've been using this truck and sedans are the way of the future. And we should probably migrate to a sedan. We, you would never do that. You would ask yourself, why do I have the truck? You know, am, am, I, am I hauling a lot of material around that a sedan is completely inappropriate for? Or am I about to have twins and we need more seating and the sedan is more appropriate for that, right? You would, you would look at the job. Windows PowerShell is, is a thing for a thing. It's a tool for administering Windows systems. Um, PowerShell, core, if you want, PowerShell, regular PowerShell, non-Windows PowerShell, is for doing the same thing across a wider set of surfaces. I think over time, as the commandlet coverage continues to improve in PowerShell, then you're going to find more people just writing PowerShell code, because that's the language that's going to keep going forward. It's going to get new features. It's going to make things easier over the long run. But I don't, I don't really regard that as a migration, right? If, if you look at the way PowerShell is designed, maybe I don't have the Active Directory commands that I can run on Linux. Well, that, that doesn't mean I have to have a Windows VM, right? I just do implicit remoting to a domain controller that has the PowerShell commandlets because it is a domain controller. And I can run all of that from my Linux box. So I... It, it doesn't feel like a migration to me. It just, it feels like obviously we have one path forward and that's PowerShell, but whatever you've done on Windows PowerShell can continue to run there. It, it, it's fine, it's mature, it's done. I think your skills need to continue moving along. Like don't stop with version five, continue into version six and seven because they're going to grow. But it's just, you know, we, we can still run all that same stuff. We've got remoting and implicit remoting and all these things that make that easy to put together. Um, I. I, yeah, I guess I guess that's kind of it. So, so do you think it's uh, fair to say that uh, there's perhaps not a ton of urgency around um, moving all your stuff to the latest and greatest version of PowerShell, and that it should just kind of happen organically? I don't think you should go rewrite your stuff. Like, if you want to rewrite a script so that you have the exercise, so that you are you are doing it to better yourself, yeah, you do that. But you're not doing it to, for the script's sake. You're doing it for your brain, and that's fine. I don't think there's any urgency whatsoever around, around moving stuff. I mean, if you've still got Windows machines, then your scripts are still going to run. Even if your entire company said, you know what, all client computers are going to be Macs now. Screw it. We're done with Windows on the desktop. We're switching everybody over to Macs. Well, okay, your Windows scripts aren't going to run, but you've still got servers. And if you don't have servers, then you don't need those Windows scripts anyway, right? Like if you've moved on to a different technology, then you don't need all that stuff anymore. So it's it's just like everything's going to be mixed. I know people have this thing in their head where they're like, no, I want everything to be on the same thing. Just stop wanting that. Like that's, that's honestly, it's a dumb thing to want. I'm sorry, but it's just don't want that. Be happy having lots of different stuff. Yeah, it's, it's one of those delightful things where your dev environment, your desktop running Visual Studio Code, which can be a Linux, Mac, or Windows machine, can write code that runs on your PowerShell 5.1 running server. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, it's great to play with the new stuff like because they do release new features like, uh, oh, cool, ternary. Oh, I haven't worked with a language that has those before. Or uh, the web commandlets are so much more optimized. Thanks, Mark, um, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and but, and uh, the yeah, one like, thing it, the one other thing you asked was about, you know, how do you convince people to take a dependency on .NET? I am, I am legit weary and exhausted of convincing people to take a dependency. Look, everyone takes dependencies on everything all the time. You took a dependency on Linux, if that's where your software is going to run. You took a dependency on having Node installed. You took a dependency on having Python. And then with Python, these 82 other libraries, right? We've been doing dependencies forever. Shut up about it. The only thing we need to be better about is documenting those dependencies so that we're not tossing code over a wall to someone who then has to figure out what they have to install. And that is literally the whole point of DevOps, right? It's, 
If you're building out an Azure resource manager template to run your app, that specifies what the dependencies are. It handles installing those dependencies. It's not actually harder for you. So just quit your crybabying and take whatever dependencies are right for the job you're solving. You know, so, like, so you're not trying to hear, but it's not in the box. Yeah, I don't give a crap what's in the box. You know what? Ideally, nothing is in the box. Nothing should be in the box. The fewer bits that are in the box, the more secure, the more stable, the more performant, the smaller the footprint, all the good things. Then you add the things to the box. I know that used to be hard, right? You had to run a bunch of NPM commands and a bunch of, of you know, APT gets or whatever package manager you're using, but it's not like that anymore, right? If you're not using containers and things like Elastic Beanstalk profiles or Azure Resource Manager templates, if you're not using those things to automate setting up the environment, then again, you don't get it. Like you are doing it wrong. That is not where the world is marching to. Go back to your Windows XP machine and have fun. I think you're very much filling Adil's emotional bank account right now. <laughs> yep, very much so. No, and it's it's be explicit about it and include versioning too, if you can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was, you know, it was one of the whole arguments against keeping PowerShell out of Windows was .NET at the time had terrible, terrible versioning issues. And like, we can fix that. All you have to do instead of just saying, oh, I'll just go grab whatever version of the DLL happens to be there. No, that's BS, dude. Tell me which one you want, and I will make sure that gets there. Just stop it. I like that answer. Thomas, do you want me to go or you have one? No, oh, go ahead. Okay, cool. This is actually further to that same thing. And I think we've kind of talked about this in many different discussions before. And Don, you brought it up before too. But I think it's worth mentioning just once again, sort of tangentially on the automation discussion. Um, and uh, it's a specific question from Bill uh, who says, how do you respond to individuals that believe that there is no time to automate? I think I know your answer already based on the last one. And I've been saying that it takes time to free up time and the automations developed will make the impossible possible. But is there more that I could say? Yeah, I, math, right? Everybody comes at this, like they have this gut instinct that obviously once I automate it, it's going to be better, but I'm going to have to take the time for that. And how do I justify it? It's called math. Um, do it in numbers. So when I was a consultant, I used to almost exclusively deal with the CFO, which surprises a lot of people that it wasn't the CIO or the CTO. And I said, but the CFO has a powerful tool that only the CFO apparently knows how to use. And it's called a calculator. And I would talk about money. I'm like, look, here's the thing. Your people make this much per year. Let's break that down. That much per year divided by 2000 hours. That's about what they're making per hour. Multiply it by one and a half. That's their fully loaded salary. That's what you're spending on that human being. If I can take 10 of those hours and then eliminate a hundred hours, you have a 90%, like a nine X return on your investment. That's what that is. It's called return on investment, but you can only do return on investment in, in money. It's got to be, this is what it will cost us. And I know how to calculate that. And if you don't, I have a book called Let's Talk Business. It runs through the whole formula. I know how to calculate it. I know how to prove the return. I will know how to prove if we didn't get the return. And then we can be accountable for that. And we can learn from that. And we can move on and do something different. But I'm going to manage this like a financial project because that's all businesses are, is collections of financial projects. Every single outcome is about how is this helping the company? Like even if you work for a nonprofit, it's, there's still resources, there's still money in and money out and outcomes, and it's all a financial project. So in, if you're working, if you happen to be working for a company that can't do math, you need to leave because that is not a company that will survive the next econ apocalypse. Um, I have a friend who works for a company uh, in the hospitality sector, and they're obviously really challenged right now. When they were preparing to reopen their business, um, you know, when the state started kind of releasing the, the gates a little bit, they spent a shit ton of money on stuff nobody needed money spent on. You know, are we gonna have masks with our little logo to hand out? Are we gonna, well, now they're laying people off, they're reducing salaries, they're cutting shifts because they're running out of cash. This is a company that can't do basic math and his, his job's in danger. Like, and, and this is a rough time to go looking for a job, but 
if you've got a company that legitimately cannot respond to a reasoned, mathematically sound financial ROI you know, conversation, then you got to go. You need to start looking now because there will be another econ apocalypse and companies that can't do math might not make it. Yeah, it's a really good point, especially from the perspective of sort of um, speaking the language of, uh, of finance specifically for businesses, because I, there are very few um, tech folks that I've come across who really delve deep into the ROI part of things, you know, yeah. really, really hone in on the return of return of yeah. for, yeah, from that's, investment. That's, yeah. that's the whole reason I wrote that book, mm-hmm. which, will, talk um, yeah. which will probably be going away. So if you want to get that, you should probably. Good. That's a good plug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, winning winning those conversations using math is near and dear to my heart as well, for sure. Uh, I did a talk a couple of years ago just called How to Take Risks Without Getting Clawed in the Face, and it's all about doing uh, quantitative analysis on stuff like this. Yeah. And uh, can't echo that enough. Um, Adil, was there more on that one? Or? Oh, that was it for that one. All right, I've got another one then. Uh, This one comes from Daniel, uh, who says, after reading Shell of an Idea, he's still got this question. Um, It seems original creators were laid off the PowerShell team after some reorgs. Is this correct and why? If not, what happened to them? Yeah, so it depends a little bit on what you mean by creators. When, When the team really first started coding version one, they were using Microsoft's um, India Development Center, and that was where all the programmers were. The program managers who are designing and architecting the thing were in Redmond. So they're 12 and a half hours off, which means if you send an email, it's basically gonna be 24 hours before you get a response. And the, the programmers in India were, were, were coders. They weren't systems administrators. They, they really struggled to understand what PowerShell was supposed to be doing, which is why Snover wrote the Monad Manifesto. Um, he did not write that to pitch PowerShell. He wrote it to try and help them wrap their heads around it so that they could operate more autonomously without all the slowdowns. Um, it didn't work. It was still too slow. And so they had to completely reorganize the team. They moved all the, the software development, software engineering effort back to Seattle so that the program managers and the coders could be together with each other all the time. Um, but that didn't result in anyone's layoffs. Like the, the people who worked for the IDC were just moved to different projects. Uh, I don't know that I've, I've run across anyone who was laid off from the team. People certainly moved on. Um, you got to understand that part of the culture with Microsoft is they actually encourage that. They, they don't necessarily love people being in one role for 20 years. They want you to move around because that helps, helps foster practices, you know, being sp- you know, spread throughout the organization. Um, It brings different perspectives and viewpoints that can be extremely effective. Uh, It takes a person who's been dealing with a certain type of customer and exposes them to new problems where where they can kind of synthesize new things together. So Microsoft encourages people to move around. Um, Sometimes people just decide they don't want to work there anymore, you know, and they they move on to a different job. But I don't don't think there was ever really mass layoffs. I don't think there was any any layoffs ever. Um, People just kind of migrated off in different directions over time. Um, There's... There's very few of the original team still on the team. Um, Jim Truher left the team and actually has come back to it. So he counts, although he took a sabbatical and went to work with a different team, uh, still at Microsoft in the meantime. Um, you know, even Jeffrey is not on the PowerShell team, right? He's, he's a high muckety muck um, in, in the Azure world now, uh, the cloud world. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how many of the original members I, I, I'm really struggling to do. Uh, Lee Holmes, although he's technically not on the PowerShell team, he's with the Azure security folks, um, but they're all around still. You know, I mean, every, everyone is still out there someplace. Like anything, yeah. right, where you have many, not just languages, but a lot of projects that just evolve over time. And I think it's actually kind of a good sign sometimes that you have different new blood coming in regularly, like young folks like Tyler, who's a part of it, who I just yeah, really and, enjoy. You know, Joey came in several years mm-hmm. ago and he was just a, a fantastic addition to the team, really got it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think he was the reason why they were able to make, make a successful open source move. Um, he came from that open source world in, in college and, and he understood it and got it. And I, I think having that opinion there helped. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's been people come and go all the time. Uh, the, the, there's been a core of the team that has moved on, but 
you could almost argue that they may have been bored. Like the core of PowerShell was was done years ago, uh, and and they were doing different stuff. And they, you know, at some point you just want a new challenge. Yeah, that's kind of how I yeah, got the feeling with people like Bruce too, like sort yeah. of moving on to the next step of their career. But yeah, we all love Joey. Sorry, Thomas, go ahead. No, as you can say, like I'm, I'm as far as I'm aware, you're completely right. I, I don't think anyone's ever been like laid off or made to leave the PowerShell team. And if they were, it was super backdoor. Um, but as a, and I work at Microsoft, not on the PowerShell team. My team's a customer of theirs, like many others. Um, part of my hiring process was made very clear to me that they hire from Microsoft first and for the team second with the rationale that uh, if you're going to be good on our team, you should be good, like not anywhere in Microsoft, like you're, you might not be a good HR person or whatever. Um, but hey, this isn't going to be the only place for you in this or in this company. There's right. going to be other organizations, other projects, other products that you can go work on. And, um, th and there you have it. A lot of those people went and found cool, um, exciting other projects and stuff to work on, like Lee and Jeffrey, especially come to mind. Yep. Sounds great. Thomas, do you have more John stuff or should I go with uh, some of the stuff I have here? Um, well, yeah, there's a, a hot button um, discussion going on in the community right now about breaking changes. Um, and I won't lead the witness whatsoever, but uh, there's a lot of different opinions about how PowerShell should handle breaking changes. And we'd be remiss if we didn't get your thoughts on the matter. Yeah. There, there's no right answer, right? I, I think that's the first thing that everybody has to realize is that there, there just flat out is no right answer for it. No technology ever in the history of the universe has found a, a graceful and perfect way to deal with breaking changes. Uh, if you look at what, what poor Windows as an operating system has been through, uh, probably 70% of our, our current problems with Windows have to do with a reluctance to create breaking changes. And yet every time they do create a breaking change, and I'm thinking about, you know, um, UWP and the Windows Store and everything else, people lose their freaking minds and, and they get no traction. Like there's just no good way to do it. I think when you scope it down to something like a language, there's a few things you could do. Um, you could just introduce the breaking change and call it a day, right? Boom. Um, the graceful way, the most graceful way most languages do that is they plan several versions down so that in version seven, uh, using a feature tosses a warning, and in version eight, it tosses an error, and in version nine, it just doesn't work. Uh, PHP does that quite a bit. You know, if, if, you, if you ramp up your logging sufficiently and run any code I've ever written, um, you'll get lots of warnings about deprecated features that will eventually be added. And then if you try to upgrade to a newer version of PHP, they just, they, stuff won't work. Um, that's painful. Like, that pain is is relatively minor on a per developer basis, but if you multiply it across the entire community and ecosystem, uh, it can be fairly significant. It requires a level of forward planning that honestly the, the PowerShell team has never really exhibited engagement in. Um, we've, we've never seen a multi-version roadmap. We kind of get, here's the new features that are coming in seven, but nobody's really thinking about, okay, we're deprecating this in seven, we're hard deprecating it in eight, and then in nine, it goes away. That's, that's a multi-step planning process that's really hard to manage. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of overhead involved with it. Um, you could just start to build in, you know, backward compatibility switches, you know, run this with minus version two, and you'll get all the version two behaviors. But if you don't, then you'll get all the version seven behaviors. That is massively expensive to maintain for the people who are writing the engine. It's hard. Um, you find yourself with a lot of old clunky code that's just shifted off and wrapped in these little functions or modules to try and self-contain them. Um, it's where a lot of your security vulnerabilities come from because the code might be fine, but the approach is no longer a secure approach. You know, it used to be when you were talking on a network, you could assume no one would hear you because the internet wasn't a thing. Well, now that the internet's a thing, we have to completely change the way we think about talking to a network and the way we did things in the past, we might just have to get rid of. So th there's no good answer. 
um, I, I, the, the PHP community, if you look at them, if you look at the Node community, if, if you look at a lot of these other high, big, you know, programming languages that are used massively, they tend to take the deprecate and delete approach. So they're planning three versions out and they deprecate something. You start to get warnings. You have to pay attention to those. Like just because you wrote the code once doesn't mean that's the end of it. Code is a living thing and it's going to have to evolve with the times too, just like you and your skill set. Um, it's, it's a reason to minimize the amount of code you write. Write the code you need, not the code you want, because when it comes time to maintain it, now you've got less code. Um, chunk it down. Don't write a 10,000 line script. Write 100, 100 line scripts, because those are going to be easier to run, see where your warnings pop up, go mitigate and fix if you need to. Um, I don't know, I, we, we've never seen a perfect solution for, for breaking changes and moving forward. We know we have to move forward. The job is changing. Like what we need to solve for has changed. And if that means we need to stop doing things the way we used to, well, that's, that's what this industry is supposed to be about, right? What was, what was Jeffrey's comment? If you don't like change, you should have gotten into lumber. We haven't had a new tree in a long time. That's a good answer. And on, on the planning note, I I have it on good authority, Don, that one of the newer PMs doesn't even know how to do math. <laughs> that would be probably Jason Helmick, I'm guessing. Yes. <laughs> that was a little troll the, right there. The former CFO of the yeah. DevOps Club. Yeah. yeah. Ha ha. Um, I've got, I've got a, I've got a, yeah, I've got a couple here actually that are good. One back to the, um, uh, back to the on topic um, piece of it with a shell of an idea. So I really like this from the Twitch chat where um, somebody, or actually Dave Carroll brought up, uh, could you comment on the impact of June Blender had on the help system and speculate whether PowerShell would and perhaps adoption would have been the same had she not been part of the team? It's one of my favorite questions. Yeah. It's hard to speculate, but it's hard to, it's hard to overstate the impact June had on the product. Um, you know, the fact that all the original commands shipped with multiple examples was, was June's just stubborn refusal to give up and, and to do the best possible. Um, the, the various ways that the help system works were driven in, in large part by, by her, you know, serious advocacy. Um, you know, I mean, there there could have been someone else on the team that was was just as committed and just as appropriately stubborn and passionate as June, but uh, you don't see it that often. Uh, she was she really really it's, it's one of the reasons I wish I could have talked more. I really did want to do a whole story about how the help system came to be, um, but it it kind of wound up being a branch of the narrative. Um, she and I really weren't able to connect, um, so we we kind of were where we were, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, from the outset, the need for a robust, useful, accurate, discoverable, readable help system was very clear. Uh, I think a lot of people looked at the man pages that we're all accustomed to on, on Linux and Unix and thought, well, that's okay. But honestly, it's, it's really terse in a lot of cases. It's not consistent. The examples are not real world. Uh, it, it, it's hard to learn how to use the command. They're good as a reference, but they're not good as a teaching tool. And PowerShell's help files, especially the, the ones with the core commandlets, I think you need to realize they're a teaching tool. You can learn to use PowerShell by reading those. I did. Um, a lot of us did, and especially in the beginning when that's all there was. And you know, the, the difference between reference and teaching, um, I think really, really came down to you know, June's passion and, and her advocacy for it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can personally attest for many uh, at, at old job, having a lot of team members um, sort of gain interest in PowerShell and going through little courses internally as a team and, and sort of introducing help and that being a big, big um, selling point. Um, yeah. So definitely we're indebted to June for all her great help there. Um, and I, I personally am going to put in a plug to say if there is a version two uh, of uh, Shell of an Idea, Don, I would totally purchase it if it had uh, an interview with June in there somewhere or some, some sort of uh, added, added feature there. That'd be really cool. Thank so you. I'm just, yeah, definitely. So I'm just going to complete the loop here because this is the question that you get every single time you're on any podcast or any show. And so, you know, it's going to, it's coming sooner or later. It's paraphrased, but it's a similar one to which, which you always get. So this is also sort of like a 
possibly a, a place where you could mention a little of the pluralist stuff. So specifically, um, Tammy has a question that says, I'm learning PowerShell. I'm at the point where I can read PowerShell and understand what I'm looking at, but I need to write a script. And I have no idea how to get it started. Uh, I feel like I've been learning another language and I'm on the cusp of crossing into the conversational level of yeah. fluency. So yeah. um, a lot of learning resources online uh, are super basic or draw the rest of the owl sort of. Um, yeah, I would, um, so can you recommend I would one? To, yeah. I would go to donjones.com slash PowerShell. And, and, and these are selfishly my books, right? But it it has the sequence. It has the chronology. It, it has a, a pretty solid, you know, shallow, not steep path to go from bit to bit to bit to bit. So even if you don't want to read those, you can find equivalent books by other people uh, on most of those topics. So, you know, you can start at the beginning. And I think one of the first one is my, my snarkily become extreme hardcore PowerShell master ninja or whatever it is. Um, that's actually like a little self-paced quiz that you give yourself. And it tells you, okay, if you get through all these and there's no answer key, right? If you know you got it right, then you got it right. And if you're not sure, then you didn't get it right. Um, so you, you kind of take these and it tells you, here's what phase you're at. And if you're at this phase, then the next step is this resource. Um, if you're a book learner, right? I'm a, I'm a writer. That's what I love to do. And so those are, those are books. Uh, if you're a video learner, do the same thing. And then you can hop on a platform like Pluralsight or whatever, and, and you can find videos that more or less correspond. I mean, Jeff Hicks has done a lot of the ones on PowerShell, uh, on Pluralsight, and he's co-authored almost all of my PowerShell books with me. Uh, so I, I would say that, um, you know, maybe it's you read the original month of lunches just to make sure you've got all the, the workings and mechanics in your mind. And then you jump into the scripting book that really does talk about, okay, here's a task. Where do we start and where do we go from there? And how do we evolve this along? In fact, the, the core narrative for learn PowerShell scripting in a month of lunches is like a 12 chapter sequence where you start with a command and then you gradually evolve that through each chapter. So it, it really does walk you through it. Yeah, I will actually put in just a little bit of an extra plug because I'm not going to, I know you're not going to plug your own platform that much, but but definitely for plural sites specifically, um, some of the work that Jeff Dix, Hicks did specifically around, um, um, you know, your first day with PowerShell and some of the early stuff and sort of getting you to the scripting tool making level of things, I think is really useful. I know Michael Bender did record one recently as well, um, a little more, a bit more current version. And uh, I actually really uh, kind of dug and enjoyed the, um, the, the skill metric uh, piece of it where you can kind of see how good you are, proficient you are yeah. at a skill. Yep. Well, yep. You want to do you want to mention that because I I don't remember yeah, the name. Skill IQ is an adaptive assessment technology um, that's proprietary to Pluralsight, and you don't have to be a subscriber to use it. All the Skill IQ tests are actually free. Um, you jump on and it will give you a numeric score. Now, if if you're taking it under uh, your company's plan, like if your company has a subscription, your boss does not get to see your numeric score. Um, we have three levels. So your, your score will fall into beginner, practitioner, or expert. And that's all your boss gets to see. Um, but once you do that, it, it lets our engine start recommending training that's specific to where you are at right then. Um, they are adaptive exams. You usually get about two dozen questions max. Uh, they usually take about 30, 40 minutes to get through. And it's not like high stress, like a, 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 you know, a certification exam. After you answer, it will tell you right then, you got that right or you got it wrong and here's why and now we'll move on to the next question. So it's, it's meant to be a learning diagnostic and teaching tool. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they can be kind of fun. Um, the PowerShell ones are, have been around for a little while. We do maintain them over time, um, but been around for a little while means we've had enough people take it that we've got a really good level set on the industry. So the score you get is not an arbitrary score that we created. It's comparing you to all the other people who've taken it as well. So you find out where you sit in relation to the broader community. That's very cool. Yeah, maybe a good place for Tammy to start if she's looking for, to gauge where exactly in terms of online resources she needs yeah. to target. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, give that a first pass. Thomas, uh, we're right five minutes we off. Time. Yeah. yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Um, so most of our audience has read a PowerShell book or has at least gone and through some type of learning journey with PowerShell, um, which I very strongly identify with. Um, and so if they're like me, they hadn't read very many like language origin stories or anything like that before. So for Shell of an idea, um, 
for anybody who's going like, oh, I don't know if I get it. Um, what would you kind of tell them? Like, w what makes the story uh, so compelling and and worth reading? Yeah, I think I think one thing to keep in mind is that you know PowerShell is not just a language; it it's a shell, and that's something that that computers have had since the very very beginnings. Um, and I think you know the key to really being successful with any technology is to understand what it's for. Uh, if you have a nail gun and you're trying to fix your car with it, then you have a fundamental disconnect around what that tool is for. And it, it doesn't always get out a lot. Like a lot of people will struggle with PowerShell because they're, they're trying to do things that are kind of anti to its, its view of the universe. And, and all tools have a view of the universe. Um, you know, if you're a nail gun, your view is that everything is a two by four. And I think understanding the history understanding what PowerShell was meant to solve and the approach its creators took, whether that approach was even what they intended or not. You know, sometimes what you do is driven just as much by circumstances as it is by intent. Understanding the circumstances around PowerShell, why it became a thing, uh, and some of the trade-offs that they legitimately chose to make helps you understand why it works the way it does, helps you understand when it's the right tool and when maybe it's not the right tool and helps you get your mind in that, that kind of zone. When Jeff and I, um, Jeff Hicks and I first started teaching PowerShell a lot, we were primarily teaching former VB scripters, right? That was our first and most obvious audience. And if, if you go back and look at the book we wrote, um, Windows PowerShell TFM, which was published by Sapien Press, it is a very VB script approach to PowerShell uh, and it's wrong. Um, we, we recognized that it was wrong once we started engaging with people who had never done VBScript. We're like, okay, so you know what an if-then statement is. And they're like, no, I, I don't. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird. That's why if you pick up Learn Windows PowerShell in a month of lunches, there's no programming in the first book. Because I realized that you know the right way to go about this for a fresh perspective was to not get into programming by chapter three. That wasn't helping people. People, there were dozens of books where by chapter three, you were doing variables and structured commands and everything. it was a programming book. That's not what PowerShell is. It's not a programming language. And I think if you understand what it is and what the people were trying to solve for and what they were forced to do to make their thing come to life, you start to really understand, okay, this is the way this thing wants to be used. And I can, I can coerce it into a few different directions. But this is, this is who it is at its heart. And if I really respect that and I really, really embrace that, I'm going to be a lot more effective. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons the story is important. I think on a completely different angle, uh, and this is almost the first question we started with, understanding the story of how this very unlikely technology came to be in a company like Microsoft in you know, the early 2000s, late 1990s, Understanding that story is a business lesson. It is a lesson on how to bring something to life to solve for a specific problem. It's a lesson on knowing who your audience is and knowing what your value is and knowing what you solve for. You don't get to solve for what you want. You have to solve for what people are gonna buy. Now in, in PowerShell's case, there's a lot of lessons learned there's a lot of wrong directions that, that didn't turn out and they wound up having to do something different. It, it's honestly, it's, it's a lesson on, on playing the political game at a very high level. It, it's knowing that if you can come in and explain things in a way that whoever you're talking to can pick up and understand, then you can be successful at whatever change it is you're trying to create. So I, I think there's a very powerful specific reason to read the book, but I think there's a bigger career reason to read the book. It's, it's a case study that we frankly don't get that often. Um, you know, nobody's written a book like this for .NET Framework, although they're working on it. Richard Campbell has is, is, is been working on it for a while. It's a big story. Um, we don't have a story like this for Python. You know, we've got some Wikipedia articles. We don't see this kind of internal jockeying and maneuvering for, for something that we can all see the outcome of. You know, we all know what PowerShell looks like. Understanding how that came to be, um, I think is, is, has been a really valuable business lesson for me. I mean, even, even now in my job now, I use some of what I've learned in writing this book. 
It's changed the way I approach problems. It's changed the way I approach other people about problems. Um, and it, it changes the way I think of envisioning something like having a vision that you know you're not going to hit in the first version, but having it out there and marching steadily one step at a time toward it uh, has, has been a very powerful leadership lesson for me. So I think there's a bunch of reasons to read it. And it's, you know, it's not a 700 page book. You can get through it in a weekend. Plus, yeah, I it's think a great that, cartoon. It's a really interesting story. Yeah, I think Thomas <laughs> finished it in like a day, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I will say uh, specifically around that, I do find that um, sort of when you talk about niches in different uh, markets that this uh, that the books fill, I, I very much feel like this one is almost like a little bit of the storytelling piece of it because a lot of um, PowerShell books are more prescriptive in terms of this is how you approach the language. I do yeah. like the background and sort of, as you said, the political sort of um, little um, uh, little fights, not necessarily fights, but little uh, positioning or that, yeah, that took place. That, yeah, exactly. That fun stuff. So it's kind of like almost like our, our version, PowerShell version of the Phoenix project in that way and that you had to win over the different uh, different pieces of the teams. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So we, we've That's used a, an hour of your valuable time, Don. Uh, where can they go get the book? Um, and uh, on that note, your other publications too. Uh, yeah, so almost everything I've done recently is on LeanPub. So if you if you just want the ebook version, you can go to leanpub.com slash you slash Don Jones, and that lists all my books. Um, I, I'm a big advocate for LeanPub, for technology books in particular, because they're very clear about showing you how much money the author gets. Um, what you don't know about Amazon is that we get about a dollar and that is not the case with LeanPub and you choose how much you want to pay above the minimum price and you see exactly how much of that goes to the author. Um, Shell of an idea is on Amazon. So, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you're in that universe and that's what you want to do, or if you want a paperback, that's the place to get the paperback. Uh, the hardcover is no longer available. So sorry, that was a limited time thing for the people who bought the LeanPub version early on. Um, but, uh, yeah, Amazon's probably the easiest. And then, um, donjones.com slash books has links to all of my books. So if you're, if you're trying to find anything in any format, um, then they'll be there. Right on. Well, we got to thank you once again for, for joining us and regaling us with your tales and wisdom. Yeah. Thanks for uh, me. In two weeks, two weeks time, we have... Uh, oh, it's me. Uh, I'm talking in two weeks. <laughs> Doing a session, uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts um, is going to help uh, give you some immediately useful advice on how to prevent getting yourself, your coworkers, and your family hacked. Uh, so don't miss that. But uh, once again, Don, thanks very much for coming out. Adil, uh, thanks for co-hosting. And Corey, thanks, thanks for running for the, the show. Corey's a linchpin here. He always uh, does all the hosting. Yeah, yeah apparently. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. It's been great. Absolutely. And I love the questions. This was a fun format, sort of having a little bit of a more of a conversational piece to it. I know with Zoom, we're all disconnected a little bit now. So it's exactly. nice to have somebody to look at and converse with in this manner. Well, if, if you ever want to do it around any other topics that I'm on, just uh, let me know. Happy to. For sure. Thanks so much. All right, folks. Thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for joining the stream. Thanks, everybody who've submitted questions on Discord chat and Slack as well. Um, we'll see you in uh, about two weeks. Thanks a lot.